Hello there, Happy New Year, and welcome to the first episode of the Long Live Rock and Roll podcast for 2022. Did you ever think we'd get here? Well, I, you know, <laughs> I, I had no expectations. So. <laughs> we survived the yeah. first year of the podcast, thanks to everyone who's been downloading and listening to it. Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah. many thanks to everyone, and Happy New Year. We've got lots of stuff planned for this year. Um, which we're really excited about, aren't we? We want to get a variety of guests on. We're going to get some uh, music colleagues, um, other people in the industry, and we're hoping to get some of our idols on, aren't we? We want to yeah, get a few people, people involved gonna, if we can. Touch, yeah. Yeah. But again, thank you guys so much for tuning in every week, for downloading the episodes, for following us on our socials, on the YouTube. We really appreciate it, and we've had an incredible first six months. Um, and yeah, long may it rain, hopefully. So yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, to kick off 2022, we are going to do an album that was chosen by Mr. Felipe here, um, which is Brothers in Arms by Dire Straits. Um, tell us a bit about it. What, what, what does this album mean to you? Not well, musically, just, just you as a fan. Personally, it means a lot because it was the first rock album that I've listened to from start to finish. We need to start the episode. <clears throat> We need to start. All the right, here we go. Haven't yeah. started properly. <laughs> on camera, on camera. We got some Guinness yeah, today. So rock and like roll. Proper <laughs> rock and roll. Here in, we go. In the morning. Hey. There we go. <laughs> Gotta pour it properly. As we well. won't make you wait for what you have to do for Guinness, which no, is where no, it sits no, for no, two yeah. minutes, isn't it? Exactly. Just... <laughs> we'll do this behind the scenes. Um, whilst it settles. Yeah. Um, whilst it settles, tell us about yeah. Brothers in Arms and what it means to you as a music fan. Uh, for me personally, it means a lot because, as I said to you, the first album I ever, ever listened to is Start to Finish instead of you know compilations or singles and stuff like that. Oh, really? Uh, so this was the first album? Yeah, it was really, played. really young. Yeah, so wow. I, I, I listened to the first two songs and I was like, wow, this is really good and kept listening to it because my stepdad was a big fan and he had two Dire Straits albums at home, which was of two CDs, right? Yeah. And it was uh, Money for Nothing, which is a compilation, so I didn't know, and uh, Brothers in Arms. So that, I think he, he told me, no, that one is just like the best of you need to listen to the album, which is Brothers and Arms. So I've right. listened to it and I got addicted to it. And obviously at the time I had, you know, CDs were the only option for me. So it was like uh, listening to the same album yeah. every day for a month or two <laughs> or something like that. And I got all my classmates at school addicted to Dire Straits as well, oh, which really? is, yeah. You're imagine, responsible. Imagine a whole like classroom of young students in South America all listening to Dire Straits. What year would this have been? Um, 1996. Seven, okay, like so there was still good music floating about yeah, in the late nineties, yeah. but Felipe's there influencing the whole yeah. of the Belo Horizonte <laughs> music scene, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but anyway, Excellent. um yeah, so obviously, you know, um the sound of the drums of the intro for Money for Nothing and the guitar riff, that is the most rock and roll thing in the album. Because we talk about rock music here, right? So yeah. some people might even argue that it's not a rock album. It's not heavy at all. Not that it has to be heavy to be rock, but yeah. and it's uh, more like a pop album if you think about it. If you think about the the, the, the sort of audience that it reaches. Uh, it reaches the and the sounds like, of it, and the sounds uh, of it. That there's a lot of pop in the album. Yes, there? there are a lot of pop elements because it's an '80s album. There's some sounds that you listen to. It's like wow, that's that doesn't really. Uh, work in this day and age yeah. it's like a bit too outdated, 80s outdated yeah. and but uh the, the composition and the ideas behind and the lyrics and they are all very rock and roll to me and also as a rock band of course yeah. and um yeah so money for nothing for me was the 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 big song at that time when i listened to the drums and the guitar I said oh that's rock and roll drum solo as an intro yeah. a long intro build up to a riff that is fantastic yeah and and yeah, it was really, really important for me that I had access to that album early yeah. in my music life. So, did it shape your playing in any way? No, no. Uh, funny or not, no. But it did um, make me want to be a drummer because of the drum intro. Because of the, all right, okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, so it kind of did shape your playing. Yeah, you well, not, play. not. It's like I, I, did, I couldn't play that thing at the time, and yeah. it's like. Uh, I didn't learn any songs from the album. For right. me. As a musician, it was like I, I just wanted to listen to, it, and I was way more interested in the guitar and the lyrics. So that's interesting. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. good. That's good. We'll, we'll remind you guys actually what the long live rock and roll uh, definition of rock and roll is. We'll take you all the way back to our first episode. God, that's twelve episodes ago now. We've uh, long time. Yeah, I don't even time. remember. <laughs> um, so we defined 
you know, for, <laughs> I love that we talk like we're, we're, we're renowned critics in the industry, but we Let's define... Let's pretend we are. <laughs> Take well, to we're making. musicians, man. You know, we, <laughs> we are part of it, aren't we? Yeah. Um, we defined rock and roll as being musical freedom. Whilst you can define rock and roll by Jerry Lee Lewis, Elvis, you know, we know this, but rock and roll as an attitude, as a cultural um, impact, for us is musical freedom. So yeah. it's absolutely fine to talk about albums that are poppy in a yeah. sense. That, but again, it's with Felipe, and after we talk through the album, we're going to define why we believe this album is rock and roll and what impact it had on music. So should we get stuck in? Yeah, yeah, excellent. All right. Well, uh, again, in true Laz style, I'll give you a few little facts about the album and you know all the stuff about it. So the album is called Brothers in Arms, and it's released by. Is it the Dire Straits or Dire Straits? <laughs> dire Straits. It's just Dire Come Straits. On. Do you know the, 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 the most no, the most annoying one of that is Eagles. Is it Eagles? The Eagles? No, it's yeah. Eagles. Yeah, it is. But you want to say the Eagles. I'm well, you can to... say it's being released by the Eagles. It yeah. makes sense. But I suppose it's not so. Not part yeah. of the yeah. name. Yeah. But it's just like you want to say the Eagles. Yeah, it was released um, by Dire Straits. Yeah, there we go. The so Dire Brothers in Arms. <laughs> So Brothers in Arms by Dire Straits released uh, mid-May of 1985. This is the interesting thing I saw. It was recorded between October 1984 and January 1985. That's a that's a four-month recording process. Yeah. Which I mean, do you think that was particularly normal for the 80s? Oh, I think so. I think the budgets were massive at the time. Right. So you could do whatever. And probably were playing gigs in between. And I think they were especially careful with that album. Um, one thing you have to consider, which is particularly interesting, is they they stopped playing after that tour. No, really? So that was the end of Dire Straits until 1992, when they got together again for one more album called On Every Street, which is really cool, a more kind of country album. Yeah. And they released that one, and that was the last album. So they actually had this, um, you know, I think they toured until 1986 and they stopped for six years, did the last album on that and call it a day. So interesting stuff, isn't it? I think the interesting thing for me is that when you listen to the album, we, we identified yesterday that there is a lot of um, layers in every song. Each song yeah. has a lot of instruments and a lot of parts going on. So it doesn't, it doesn't totally surprise me that it's a four month recording thing, but for nine songs, four months, you know, I get it. I know how yeah. the industry works. I know how recording works, but... I don't know, it did just seem like a long time. I think, yeah, because they, I think they were doing and redoing stuff. So um, It had to be perfect. Not, yeah, Knopfler has always been uh, Dire Straits' main producer. So he's like, apart from writing the lyrics, playing the guitar, singing, yeah. and driving the, the band's tour bus, <laughs> uh, he was, um, which is true, he was... Um, really? He was well, the driver? Yeah. <laughs> he was it's like also, Bruce Dickinson flying yeah, the plane. Exactly. Flying he does it? everything. So basically, he was he was a producer. He wanted things to be perfect. And um, um, the the actual producer of the album, Neil Doffman, who was working with him, um, apparently was also a perfectionist. Of course. Yeah, that's that's their job, isn't it? You're yeah, producing yeah. an album, you want things to sound good. Well, we spoke but, in, in, what, in the episode last year about Hendrix, how yeah. much of a perfectionist he was. I imagine Knopfler was the same. Yeah, exactly. What what surprises me about Brothers in Arms is you reach a certain point in your career where you, you're famous for something. Right. Dive Straits started in 1978, uh, and the first album was quite bluesy, country-ish. And... You listen to that kind of really intricate guitar playing when punk music was taken over. Right. And they were yeah. like, wow, these guys are different. You know, they're a bit like, sound a bit like the band and Bob Dylan and uh, Lou Reed. And, yeah. they, and they have this really nice guitar uh, style that actually defines the sound of the band. And they were famous for playing longer versions of the songs live. Uh, Alchemy, which is their yeah. double live album, is one of my favorites. And it features a 10 minute. Uh, Sultans of Swing, oh, wow. like it's a five-minute guitar solo, and he was famous for that. When they started recording Brothers and Arms, I don't know if it was intentional or not. We talked about this. We were listening to the album last night, and it's like it's you don't have a guitar solo until halfway through the album. Yeah, how can a band like them, famous for their guitar solos and everything guitar related? don't have a guitar solo for five songs. It's interesting. How cool is that? Yeah, it's very cool. <laughs> it's interesting because I know Metallica did the same with St. Anger, but for St. Anger, they removed guitar solos from the whole album. And I suppose... Just, okay, yeah. In 
I just want to say this is the only show where we can go from house race to Metallica <laughs> and back. It is a tenuous yeah. link, but, but yeah. yeah, all right. But, um, no, I mean, like, do you know what? And I was saying to you when we were listening to the album that there's there's, there's some lyrics in one of these songs that we're going to talk about because, well, you will get to that later, but this definitely is an album feels like. I don't want to say a concept album, and I don't want to say one continuous song like Dark Side of the Moon yeah. sometimes feels, but it does feel like one experience. And what I mean by that is almost like a play yeah. or a film. Yeah. And what I say, um, the reason why, because I mentioned this yesterday, is that I, I asked you if you knew that in the movie Mulan, the anim animated Disney movie, there are so many standard Disney songs you know we all we all know them if you know the movie but there's one moment in the Mulan movie which is where as soon as they see the dead army and the mood of the movie changes like that there's no more music for the rest of the movie so you have half of the the the, the, the movie with music and yeah. the other half without music the yeah. same way you have the is it the Wizard of Oz that we have half of the movie the, the color yeah, and black and white, color. and then yeah. and then color. Yeah, and uh, it's yeah. So it's it's kind of you 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 set a cer a certain standard for half of that uh, uh, art piece, yeah. <laughs> and then yeah. for the, the the second half, you just change it completely. Yeah, from you know song number six until the end of the album, then you have the guitar solos again, yeah. culminating with. Uh, um, Brothers in Arms, which is the longest guitar, guitar solo, solo and yeah. is completely guitar based yeah. and makes you think, oh, that's Dire Straits again, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But uh, it, it kind of, the thing is, how can you do that uh, with uh, um, actually starting in a different style? You know, how can you lead the listener to get to the point, oh, okay, I'm more familiar with this, but actually. I see what you mean. Do, my, so, do you ask, do you mean that you think. If Brothers and Arms was the first song, that would be a lot easier for the regular fans, listeners. For the fans, because yeah. they say, okay, I'm used to guitar solos. But then again, uh, the album sold 30 million copies. Wow. And the song Money for Nothing stayed on top of the charts for 10 weeks. So th that means they actually managed to reach a uh, much bigger audience than their own audience. And it's fantastic yeah. to think of that. Like I'm, I'm a big fan of Abbey Road, the album, because... Uh, the Beatles have done so much, and at that point, at the end of their career, they did something extra. So, if you do not consider that Dire Straits got back for just one more album, that would be like their last studio album, which is the fifth studio album and last. Yeah. And they were not that young; they were not another up and coming band. They were not like uh, um, famous amongst like young audiences and stuff like that. Yeah. And they came up with songs that every teenager was listening to. That is amazing, you mm -hmm. know, yeah. and especially... The, well, it's the molding massive... a generation, isn't it? Exactly. So you have this band, uh, they're all over 30s or 40s. It molded Belo Horizonte's generation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even my, my mates were listening to it. Sorry, carry yeah. on. Sorry. But you got this band, uh, um, you know, I don't know how old they were at the time, but they didn't look like uh, young and handsome, and they were selling albums for, for American teenagers. So, yeah. uh, because of Money for Nothing, because the I Want My MTV campaign, because of loads of things uh, related to the album. So, I believe the reason why there's no uh, guitar solos until half of the album, which is something I only noticed by listening to the album again. See, I didn't, I didn't even notice, but there's lots of guitar, but not in that way. It's not yeah. like... There's no, uh, there's no solos. Yeah, yeah there's no... not, it's, it's not... Mark Knopfler is not showing off. He's like, yeah. okay, do you know what? I'm a good songwriter, and I'm going to write a good commercial album the first song so far away can you talk through the songs can you or, or, or is it you else? choose yeah. i mean so yeah. let's talk, so, yeah. so let's let's talk about it, it. yeah because uh, uh, so song um, number one is so far, uh, so far away and it's a pop love ballad with a clean guitar riff intro which is like so simple and the lyrics are so i don't know naive Right. <laughs> you know, very like a uh, straightforward love song. The guy is is, is tired of being alone, etc. Yeah. And the backing vocals are beautiful, like long notes and really well harmonized. And it's a huge contrast because Northwest's voice is more like spoken yeah. uh, than 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 you know singing, isn't it? I thought the uh, thing that stood out to me of that song was the backing vocals. You pointed them out to me when we were listening. Just so um, tight. 
and you know we, we made the comparison before and we'll make it again in one of the songs to the band um and their backing vocals and their harmonizations of each other's voice voices were incredible but the the folk feel you get from it is because uh i'm gonna say that they're not always a hundred percent in time with each other but that's the live feel that they were going for yeah. whereas this it's so polished the backing vocals start at the same time and they end at the same time and the harmonies are just perfect and it yeah. really gives a pop vibe to this song and they're just loud enough in the mix yeah they're the, this, the yeah. perfect spot it really is it's like it's, it's like really an cool. extra layer of keyboards yeah isn't and it? they have two keyboard players <laughs> in the band so they you know all those kind of pad sounds that you you just hold a note or a chord in order to kind of build a foundation for, for, for the harmonies, and they do loads of that. Yeah, it's a big uh, 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 um, characteristic of the band for sure. The keyboards and the backing vocals, yeah. specifically in this album, and then yeah, so so far away, great song. Uh, the, nice guitar. The, the one thing I want to say about so far away is that the first thing I said to you when we listened to this album last night is it really, really, really reminded me of nineties Britpop music. Yeah. Um, I couldn't help but hear. I, I I really heard stuff um, from that Britpop band Pulp, yeah, uh, the ones who did Common People, yeah, uh, and I just I'm trying to figure out what it was. I think it was it's the... a bit sarcastic, isn't it? The way he <laughs> sings, eh? yeah, that's true. But yeah. the, the vocal, the vocals as well, because he's not singing and he's not talking. It's somewhere in between the guitars, and I suppose the production in a sense yeah. were the same. Common People has a lot of keyboards and padding in there, just like this one. So the first thing I thought when I heard So Far Away is I thought Pulp and Britpop. And <laughs> that is, when you said that to me, it was like, wow, how can you relate that story to Britpop? But did you wonder, hear it afterwards? Did, yes, did I, I could. Saying? Yeah, uh, uh, you, you're talking about, I think if you consider the lyrics and the way he's telling the story, it's not taking himself too seriously, is it? No, no, And Britpop right. Pop, for me, is a massive piss take. <laughs> Isn't it? It's like, they taking the piss of, uh, you know, uh, British lifestyle yeah. or, or things that most people were doing all over the world, like yeah. modern life uh, um, style, yeah. pretty much. And they just say, this is all rubbish. We're going we're gonna, to uh, make a big joke out of it. That's what, how I see Britpop. If you listen to songs like... Uh, uh, She's part electric. Life, yeah, part oh, life. Yeah, part blur. life. You know, all that's, all that We're going to stick stuff. all these in the playlist. I know we're talking about a 1980s album, but hopefully yeah. you hear the, well, the contrast musically between, that I've made between Common People and So Far Away, but lyrically, like Felipe is talking about, the, the lyrics, you, you'll tell us more about the lyrics of this album, but the sarcasm in oh, it. Oh, yeah. I'm, and so I'm, we'll put these know. in there and listen to Park Life, listen to She's, She's Electric, and you, you, hopefully you hear the, the lyrical comparisons that we're making. Exactly. And you see that kind of sarcasm, or whatever you call it, is, is, is really, really evident in this album. But Money for Nothing is all about that. <laughs> and uh, so far away, you know, I'm try, tr uh, tired of making out on the telephone while you're so far away from me. So, like, yeah. it's like really cheesy yeah. uh, uh, pop lyrics. But they're and laughing at themselves. They are, because if you, if you listen to the first album, uh, the lyrics are so clever, so well written. What first and they, album? Dire Straits. Straits. What's yeah. it called, the first album? Uh, dire Straits. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. Uh, Is there a song that we should put in the playlist? Uh, you know, um, Wild West End. Okay. Uh, it's a beautiful song. Oh, you I played with that? Yeah, that yes. was lovely. That was lovely really song. Really nice. And the lyrics talking about life in London, stuff like that. Really clever uh, storytelling. And that's the thing about Mark Knopfler is a great storyteller. Yeah. Uh, just like, um, for me, just like Dylan and Hendrix. So, and what's the comparison that we made between Hendrix, Dylan and Knopfler? They're not the best singers. No, technically. Yeah. Not. It's not about that. His voice has got a really nice low tone that not many singers have. And he knows how to use it yeah. for sure. But again, um, he leaves the, the technical elements for the backing vocals and the voice is just telling yeah. the story. Yeah, exactly. So uh, and, and the way he does it in this album, as I said to you, there's loads of, apart from, I think, Brothers in Arms is a really serious uh, song, really serious approach to songwriting and lyrics. But... Uh, so far away, money for nothing. They're like, okay, I'm just having fun here, and I'm, you mm. know, taking the piss out of whatever uh, cheesy love pop songs you want to, yeah. you know, you want to think about. And yeah. for the for the song comparisons, I'm going to put into the playlist "Hurricane" by Bob Dylan and "Hey Joe" by Jimi Hendrix, because they're both s songs where they're not singing; they're kind of talking slash 
well, shouting at you, um, and they're storytellers. Uh, yeah. Just like uh, so far away, uh, actually, most of this album. Yeah. Um, but anyway, let's move on to song number two, which is the probably the most famous song on this album, yes. which is called "Money for Nothing." And certainly, the most important song for them in the album because it's what connected them to younger audiences. And why do you think they did one, that? Because of MTV. So MTV was running a campaign trying to get the cable operators to to um, have MTV all over America. So the campaign. Uh, campaign's slogan was I want my MTV so they wanted people to say I want my MTV I want my MTV right. and and to kind of you know uh, ask for the, the the cable operators to to provide them uh, MTV so that was a, a big uh, campaign it was highly successful mainly because of this song yeah so basically they and also they did a video which was a 3d animation which looks awful nowadays, right? Yeah, by better at the time, but it was kind of... as the song is sarcastic and it's a big joke anyway, yeah. it still looks good today, I, I think, in that sense. Yeah. And everything is so square, like it's terrible. But um, it was like a massive hit. The band is not featured in the, in the video, pretty much. I think there's a bit of them on the TV. So they get this, okay. they, yeah, they appear on the TV or yeah. something like that. But it's like two guys carrying this stuff around the, uh, a, a store in America you know, carrying TVs, carrying refrigerators, yeah. all the things they say in the lyrics. And um, and that's the video. Uh, there's a dog as well, whatever. It's, <laughs> it's just awful. But a 3D animation uh, on MTV talking about MTV. So Sting joined the band for that song. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, they recorded in, you know, you know, you have the name of the studio. It's, um, um, it was the uh, Monster App. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was air in Montserrat, yes. and it's actually in the a Caribbean island. Yes, and they actually did a concert for Montserrat years later, whatever. So it's um um yeah, it's a it's a studio where everyone recorded. I think Phil Collins as well. And yeah, Sting of course, and Sting joined them, uh, and he sings the "I Want My MTV" line right at the beginning, and he uses the melody of one of his own songs. Uh, Which Don't song? stand so close to me, by the police. Don't stand so. Don't stand, oh, so, don't right, stand yeah. so close to me. I, I want my, my, I want my, I want my MTV. MTV. So it's the same <laughs> thing. So that's why he got credits as a songwriter. I think he didn't want it, but the label said, "No, you got, you got to do this because you know it's, yeah. you own that melody. It has to be like that." Uh, so he contributed with that. His vocals are uh, really, really cool. Uh, it suits the song uh, perfectly. So I that campaign helped to to boost MTV's. Uh, um, uh, reach and 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 oh, made really? and, and helped a lot because they it was their most famous video at the time. For, yeah, the, the biggest video for Dire Straits and MTV. So that video that is time. totally connected to the history of MTV and helped really? them a lot. Yeah. Oh, wow. So I tell you, musically though, I found something really interesting about the the Money for Nothing is that although it is a guitar based song, the guitar is produced. And almost sounds synth-like, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, I tell you what I think. You remember, um, you know, Zeppelin, Trampled Underfoot? Yeah. Um, bam, 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 I know that yeah. is actually a synth. Yeah. But the guitar the sounds guitar like that on synth. Money For Nothing sounds yeah. like the synth. It's all very produced and very polished. And a lot of effects, I imagine, have been put on the instruments. Um, but it doesn't detract from it. I think the guitar riff is very recognisable. It's very energetic. It has a personality to it. Um, but yeah, just something interesting. I it's, about it's, it. it's really, really interesting. And um, it's such a strong riff. You can recognize it. And the fact that Notcliff plays it with his fingers, it doesn't use plectrum anytime. I haven't seen many guitar players who can actually emulate that riff because people try to play it with plectrum. It doesn't really, doesn't, it doesn't doesn't work. really work. Yeah. And the way he does it is so, so cool. And he repeats that riff over and over. Yeah. Also, uh, the drum solo. So there's a couple of things to say. Um, their drummer was a guy called Terry Williams, fantastic rock drummer, who joined the band after the original drummer quit. And uh, where is Lars going? Lars is not here anymore. Just checking, it's all going well. It's all going well, isn't it? Yeah. No technical issues, all right. So Terry Williams joined the band and he did some really, really nice, uh, heavier versions of the, 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 the drum parts live. And I think it's, it's an awesome drummer. But the producer wasn't happy, he said, this is not a rock album, like not traditional, not a heavy or hard rock album. So we need someone who can play jazz. And Notcliffe wow. wasn't convinced. 
So no, no, I like I like Terry's work in the album. So the album was entirely recorded, and they called Omar Hakim, which, who is a fantastic session drummer, one of the, the you know most recorded drummers, and he I think he was drumming for Sting at the time. The producer said, "I want someone who's a jazz player, and you're gonna understand it when you when you hear." It. And so they sent Terry back home <laughs> for a few days. <laughs> So, okay, Terry, your, your, your job is done here. We're going to get someone else to redo some of the drums. So uh, Omar Hakim came and re-recorded every single drum part in the album, apart from one, which I'm going to tell you. Wow. Um, and when Knopfler finally listened to it, said, oh, I know what you mean. He got it. It does yeah, sound true. better. It's more subtle. It's other, you know, uh, it's a completely different approach. It's kind of soft comparing to Terry Williams playing yeah. and it suited the album perfectly so they kept Omar's parts nor Terry Williams parts but the intro for money for nothing that's the only contribution Terry by Terry Williams. Williams that is still in the song that's a worthy contribution the album. Though, isn't it it's and worthy. it's like wow because that was the, one of the things that made me want to play the drums exactly and it's know, the only and it's, part yeah and it was like wow what an amazing kind of random drum solo yeah. as an intro i think that's that is proper rock and roll drumming <laughs> and i think maybe Omar came was like okay you know what i don't have to redo yeah. that that's rock and roll <laughs> and Excellent. yeah yeah cool stuff and um yeah. yeah and the other thing um about the song is Knopfler wrote the lyrics entirely based on a conversation he heard Really? So that's why we're going to talk about this because we were talking uh, about things you cannot say and things you can't yeah. say nowadays in music. And then I'll tell you this story. Well, Andy and in society together. So yeah. the lyric, this is the one, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. So the lyric is, he, he's, the lyric is, and it's repeated, is Little Faggot, which obviously is a homophobic slur. Um, but explain to us the context of well, that in the song. That, that's the thing. Um, he's, it, you've got two guys you know, moving things around in a shop, they carry TVs, refrigerators, you, you name it, and they really not happy about their, their lives. And they're watching MTV, talking about the millionaire pop stars, musicians, uh, oh, look at that little faggot. Oh, He's so, a millionaire. Yeah. He's got his own jet plane. He's got et cetera, et cetera. Oh, but you know, maybe I should learn to play the guitar. Maybe I should learn to play the drums. So they keep talking about how they want their, that lifestyle. And because they hate the person who has that lifestyle, they start calling him. That's know, why little they call it, Yeah. Because oh, he oh, look at look at his hair. You know, it's like, you know, it's not how we are. They they. So for me, those two guys carrying stuff around, they are the bad guys in the story. Yeah. Well, then. And you want to portray that guy or someone who is who is not unhappy with his life, but he's jealous of someone else's success. Yeah. So that's not a nice feeling to have, is it? No, so no. he's portraying them as as the bad guys or, or something like that in the, in, in the story, isn't it? It's like, yeah. it's, oh, you know, those people who are jealous of someone else's lives and they are using this lure. Yeah. So it's not the problem we have, which I believe we have nowadays, which clashes with the musical freedom of rock and roll that we keep talking about, is you can't say one thing or another. Oh, you can't use that slur because it's offensive. Yes, it is yeah. offensive. It exists in the real world and stupid people use that slur. Yeah. So if I have a song where I, in which I portrait a, 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 um, a character that I dislike, so this is the kind of person I dislike, and he's going to use this slur that I wouldn't use. And we got to point, you know, it's kind of, I'm pointing the finger at those people. Mm. Not if, I don't think he, he had a massive point about it, but he was literally just uh, uh, creating a character that would say those things. Yeah. And in actual fact, he heard those exact lines. Pretty much the whole song is the conversation. Is a conversation he heard in a shop. I think he was maybe he was buying a TV, whatever. Yeah. And he heard these two guys carrying stuff around, talking about. Oh man, so I'm so tired of you know m moving these refrigerators, these color TVs, and you know, oh look at that little faggot on MTV. He's got everything. Yeah. He's, they started saying those lines, and Noffler said, "Oh, this is fantastic." So he hid himself in a corner with his <laughs> note notepad and started writing everything the guys were saying. It's like 
this is this is so cool. This is going to become a really great song. Interestingly, that though, was the, the song that we've already put in the playlist, Hurricane by Bob Dylan, that you and I'm not going to say this one, that uses the N word because in the same sense, I can't remember the song fully. It's about, um, I think it's about a black man who is accused of a crime that he didn't commit. And like each verse is about how this crime And is. they call him the N-word. He, he, well, Dylan is doing exactly what we've just discussed. He is being one of the racist police officers, I believe, and calls the black criminal yeah. the N-word. So should we be allowed to use those words? Actually, we are allowed. In you my, know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just yeah, the consequences. People are going to cancel them, or yeah. whatever. But no, but, I, think, I think if an actor is allowed to be on a film and play a character that uses a homophobic or a racist slur, then the, the problem with music is that you can't make well, you it obvious. Yeah, people associate the lyrics to the singer's opinions and views. Well, it's just but like you've got to be clever enough to money, understand. Money for nothing. I, it's just an instinctive nowadays. I hear the word that was used. I heard the words little faggot, and I looked at you, and I went, oh, interesting. Can you say that in a song? Yeah, I said, did he just say that? And well, you said he's playing a character. And I think if that's if, if if an actor can do that on a screen and be a character who is horrible, and you racist, meant to, homophobic, and if you don't understand that you meant to, uh, well, how can I say? They want you to hate the character. Yeah, that's it. For those You're reasons. supposed to hate that. Character. So if an actor can do that on screen, I don't yeah. see why a musician can't do that. But well, nowadays, the, well, the you, popularity and the reach of some of these pop what songs, I, what I believe is, you can just be cancelled. I, I believe they would censor that part of the song if they wanted to play it on a radio today. Yes. Or, yeah. or no, I think it still plays as it is. But if they were launching this song today. They would have problems, but the artist would come under fire regardless. Oh uh, yes, just yeah. because they use that most word. Most likely, most likely. Um, and you know, I think ultimately to... you're right. The word exists, um, and as long as listen, if someone is, if Mark Knopfler is being himself and calling someone that, then rightly so, we should say that's yeah. not okay. But people need to understand the context of it. Music is not just about the artist singing what he wants to sing about. Sing about it's stories, it's experiences, yeah. it's conversations in a fridge store. Exactly, <laughs> that's what, and it's uh, all real life. What he's, what he's uh, um, telling in that song is a real life conversation and those people exist. Can yeah. we pretend they don't exist? Yeah, good point. Can we pretend that people don't talk like yeah. that? Should we do it? Yeah. So I think uh, uh, it's it makes the song even more rock and roll in that sense, telling a real life story. Life is not perfect. Rock and roll doesn't have to be, and that's a really really uh, strong thing. Yeah. Uh, good, good yeah, to end anyway. on money for nothing there. Oh, we're um, not going to end there because we have a segment now. Oh, you want to do it now? Okay. No, why not? It makes That's sense, yeah. yeah. So um, we will introduce a normal segment that hopefully you're, you're familiar with now. Um, this is Laz Unleashed. So in this segment of Laz Unleashed, it's going to be a little different because Felipe is going to recount a story of when we were on tour in Brazil. So uh, take it away. Yeah, so we were in the car, me, Jack and Laz. And your friend, Umberto. Yes. Exactly. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Jack is Jack J. Hutchinson, the artist yeah. we play with. And we were listening to Money for Nothing on the radio, I guess. I no, like, no, no, no. You, you wanted to show me the song. Oh, yes. I, I haven't heard the song before. So we played the song. I said, this is so iconic. And Jack was like, yeah, l listen to that guitar riff. And then we had a massive Las Unleashed moment. This is where Las Unleashed started, that isn't is it? Exactly. That's this where we were. Yes, that was the whole <laughs> full circle. Iconic, historic moment. Um, oh, so sorry, Las said, after we've played the song, we were all excited, the three of us, me, Umberto, and, um, and Jack, like, wow, what a song, isn't it? And silence. And everyone looks at Las. We were, we were expecting his opinion once. He didn't say anything throughout the whole song. He said, yeah, pretty average, isn't it? So what? This is one of the most iconic guitar riffs of all time. Yeah, average. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, yeah, it doesn't get to me. You know, it's like the vocals are a bit boring, it? repetitive. The riff goes on and on. The song is too long. Don't like it. And that was it. <laughs> I would say, wow, that's last unleashed. That's how that's, we that's came up literally with the name. where the phrase happened. That, that's where you, you, your Instagram name came out of this. It all came it? on this, yeah. yeah. Um, there's a, the, do you know so, but yeah. now I uh, yeah, I think uh, you owe Mark Knopfler an apology. 
Um, yes, and I will I say that. I hope Mark Knopfler listens to this one day <laughs> and laughs at it. The and apology someone called his song average. The, the apology <laughs> will come because I didn't hear the song in context of the album, and having heard it yesterday, I thought it fits in really nicely. And actually, it's a, it, it, it it's a, it's the hit of the album, it and is. it's almost it almost feels like it was written to be that. Um, and yeah, I think. In, again, in context, you got to remember, I don't think I even knew when the song came out when we listened to it. Maybe, because it really well produced this album. It I is. thought it could have been it maybe sounds, 90s. We talked about it. It sounds a bit too, too 80s. Yeah, but yeah. It is but but it this is. song on its own could have been 90s. Good. I think uh, in some extreme circumstances, it could have even have been late 70s, you know, with really good production. But right, it, it's it's a good tune. It's a it really is. good tune. It fits nicely in the context of the album. Um, and yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm right. sorry, Mark Knopfler, for calling the song average back in Brazil in 2019. Um, I, 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 yeah. Shall we cancel last for that comment? <laughs> I think we should. I was going to say, would I put He's it in apologising now, so shall yeah. we uncancel it's last? A good, it's a great, good track. Um, now that I've heard it in the context of the album, it fits really yeah. nicely. It's a great rock track. So, it anyway. is really cool. So, so let's move on. Track three, yeah. Walk of Life. Ah, <laughs> very cool one, this one. Very what cool. a tune. Yeah, very country-esque, isn't it? Really country style. Totally country. Again, no guitar solos. The guitar is just doing a really country um, style riff yeah. all the way through. And the keyboards, they lead the song, don't they? Yeah. So you have one keyboard, uh, one, one of the keyboard players is doing the, you know, just the, the pads, just the, just like holding the chords. And you have the main melody on top of it played by another keyboard. Again, that's Mark Knopfler writing a good song but not necessarily being the lead instrumentalist in that mm -hmm. song. Uh, so it's all about the keyboards. And it, talk, it talks about a, a guy busking, isn't it? Playing famous old songs and trying to earn his money, playing all night long. And it's just that. It's just like enjoy your life. It's yeah. a really, really cool song. The video clip for that one is amazing, in case you guys don't know. Uh, they showed loads of uh, footage of sports, like uh, American football, basketball, when th things go wrong all the time. Oh, really? They, like, <laughs> loads of uh, 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 those really good athletes m not scoring and, you know, and falling. And, and just things yeah, don't failing. work. By the end of the video, they get everything right. So it oh, works. Well, cool. And you have the band playing. Just I think like, the interesting thing for me about the song was that although the, the, the style is very country, I think that if have you take if you take away the keyboards and the backing vocals, it's a country tune. But you put them in, and it becomes a pop tune yeah. with country elements and country yeah. influences. But it's very well written because there's a difference in popularity between country and pop. Yeah, obviously, pop means popular. Um, so the the, the compositional technique techniques he's used to put those BVs and synths in uh, keyboards in and make it more accessible, I think it's really well, really, really, really well written the song. Yeah, yeah. and it's just, uh, yeah, it's it's just a, a kind of, a, for me, a uh, um, sing-along song. Yeah, and it, very it, enjoyable. It, 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 yeah, it? yeah. It, 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 I want to dance when I listen to it, yeah, so it, it just it, served the yeah. purpose perfectly. Exactly. It's a short song in yeah. comparison to the, the rest of the album, all songs are very, very long. And then they move on into your latest trick, which is yeah. the fourth song in the album. And has a long, uh, um, jazzy build up. Build it? up. There's a trumpet solo at the beginning, and it, it, it leads you into the sax solo. And the main melody again. You don't have a guitar solo. You don't even have a proper sax solo. You have the sax melody or riff. And it's funny. The saxophone is the lead instrument in this song, and I'm including vocals in that. Yeah, the saxophone plays a bigger part than any of the vocals. You said to me yesterday. Well, we I think that yeah, you the, said there's not even a chorus. The chorus, oh, well, there is, is the sax. chorus. Yeah, yeah. But the saxophone melody is the chorus. Yeah, it's like the uh, you hear the verse and the sax riff or theme, and then the verse again and the sax again. So the Which sax is, is yeah, the solo. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Oh, the really solo is the chorus. The, the saxophone yeah. gave off very eighties vibes to me. Uh, but it didn't. <laughs> it didn't detract from the song. It's it's the the Brecker Brothers. Isn't it, it's yeah. just like I could place it. I could place the song yeah. and say this was done in the eighties because of the sax. But yeah. Um, <laughs> Michael and Randy Brecker, right? Randy's on saxophone. I think. Um, um, I think Michael Brecker is saxophone player. Uh, here Let's Michael, check the notes. No, we've right. got notes. Michael Brecker, Brecker is saxophone and Randy yeah. Brecker is trumpet. Yeah. They're, they're known as the Brecker Brothers. You should go and check out some of their stuff because they're fantastic players. They do a lot of jazz fusion. Um, I'll find a song and I'll put one in the playlist, but they're very cool. 
Um, and yeah, so this is an interesting album because of that as well. They've got so many musicians to collaborate. So it's not like, you know, the core of the band is a guitar player, bass player, two keyboard players. Yeah. I mean, so you man. can't do an album, a rock album with just those four guys. <laughs> you need more people. So anyway, yeah. So um, uh, yeah, great after, song, after your latest trick comes track five, which is called Why Worry. And I just want to start off by saying that we know Mark Knopfler as a guitar I mean, would you call him a virtuoso? Would you call him one of the elites? Or would you just call him a very, very good guitarist? I would call him everything you said, like rituals. You think so? That's the same thing. Because okay. you don't have too many guitar players that can emulate his style. That's what, you know... Um, That's a good point. When, when you, yeah, when you when have someone when that no one can sound like him. Yeah, when you've made your own sound, yeah. it's hard to replicate. One thing I love is, why worry, for me, the first two minutes sound... you know. Um, you, I can't remember what you said to me yesterday, but you said the guitar reminded you of something. You said it was almost like country guitar picking. And I said, I hear that, but what I hear more of is the Deer Hunter theme played on classical guitar by John Williams. And again, this will be in the playlist, but listen to it because you'll hear the comparisons. His finger picking technique on Why Worry is just incredible. And I'm not even a guitarist. I can just hear the accuracy of his playing, the style of his playing. The dynamics, the soothing tones and textures, it is it is a stunning intro to a track. It is Why Worry was it? beautiful. And again, without playing a solo, without showing off, Knopfler is, is, is it, just showing everyone how, yeah. how good he is as a guitar player. Such a yeah. clean guitar tone as well. And you, see, you mentioned the classical element of it. He, he wrote the, the soundtrack of one of your favorite movies, isn't it? Yeah, The Princess Bride. And it's classical. Yeah, right. and it's guitar based as well. Yeah, and guitar yeah. based, and it's very classic. Um, I'll see if I can find um, the Princess Brides because I've looked for it before and I can't, I haven't found it, but it's. Da, 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 so we're going to put that on the playlist. And it's very classical orientated again. But yeah. again, Mark Moffler on his main instrument, the guitar. Yeah, doing a great job. And the yeah. lyrics again, and in this case, is the opposite of So Far Away, in my opinion. It, it's not. Um, cheesy and uh it's not a piss take for me is being honest about you know trying to help someone he loves or, or yeah. either him or the character they, the they feel very song. heartfelt these lyrics they're quite yeah. emotional and the harmonies between them were lovely we you mentioned the band when we were listening to them yesterday and this song reminded me of rocking chair by the band which again we'll put in the playlist um, yeah. it, it just feels uh, again i know i said that i was drawn to the classical side of it but if we take what you said, which is the country style guitar, the lovely harmonized songs, it does feel like a, a band is. of country folk players sitting there it, playing their playing their music. Exactly, it seems it's like a lovely uh, song. Yeah. Lovely song. And it's not that one. I think that one wasn't a single or anything, but it's one of my favorites. Really, yeah, really very good. Nice. Moving anyway, on. Yeah, track six is "Ride Across the River," which you said is you love. I think it's the weakest song in the but album. You still like it a lot. I like it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But the thing about this is that. It was. It's very reggae. Has a scar thing. It feels like um, what Madness were doing in the early yeah. '80s. You know, it must be love. The kind of pop reggae thing that, whether the hybrid that was particularly what well, Madness were famous for. That. The other thing that came to mind is, I, w I wouldn't say this track feels like a joke in that sense, but it does feel. Um, slightly out of place considering the other tracks you could group two or three of them together and say that oh, these, these three have elements of country, these three have elements of pop, these three have elements of the jazz, the saxophone. Yeah. This one feels like it stands out. And it reminds me of Houses of the Holy, Led Zeppelin, Jamaica. Jamaica. Yeah. Yeah, and you, you've mentioned uh, uh, Madness with It Must Be yeah. Love, uh, which is, again, this is like, in this two cases, like rock bands uh, trying to sound like a reggae band. Yeah. And I think the, the Zeppelin, of that, Zeppelin did it to have a laugh. Yes, they did Madness for a laugh. Did it and as a I career. think Knopfler did because he could do it. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> it's like I can do thing, this. The other thing to mention about here is that there's a there's about two minutes of solos, isn't there? And they're yeah. really good in this song. Oh Fantastic yeah, that's solos. where the guitar actually takes the lead that's and, solo, yeah. and plays Finally. the solo. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's Mark Knopfler again. Yeah, yeah, really cool song. Um, number seven, we have the man's too strong. We love that one. Really good track. <laughs> the one thing, and you said to me at the start. Take note that the song is going to feel 
like it takes you to all different levels of dynamics. So I know we've said it before, but for people who aren't, who don't know musical terms, dynamics means the volume of what you're playing or how the hard you're hitting drums. You know, the contrast, you, really quiet we or say, really loud, you know. We say a musician is good at dynamics when they can play really quiet and really loud and move from one to another Seems and play so, everything yeah. in between as well. Now this happens in this song quite a few times and then you pointed out to me and it was almost it's almost like you don't notice it that there's no drums in the song. There's no drums. And it's, and it's like uh, the chorus when he says the men's too strong. It's like someone punching you in the face. Yeah. And then it goes quiet again. And it's such a cool song. And you have a synth guitar mm -hmm. played by a guy called Jack Sonny who joined the band for the tour, uh, played a few gigs with them. And Knopfler always used the second guitar player to play the rhythm guitar live. And for this album, I think Knopfler recorded pretty much all the guitars. And this guy joined the band for this song. And, and uh, after that, he played with them. Interesting story about him. He was a pro musician, but he was working at a music shop, a guitar shop. And Knopfler used to go there, talk to him, um, you know, in the late 70s. And one day he called him and said, do you know what? I need a guitar player. Would you join us? Can you imagine you work in a guitar shop and one of the most famous bands in the world said, yeah, yeah we want you as a guitar player. Wow. <laughs> the, the guy was, you can see him in the videos. He did all the videos, uh, um, even for the songs he didn't record. He's in all the videos for this album. Just like, and he looks so excited. He's your life changing like, in one yeah, day. <laughs> yeah, so cool. Sorry, really I really just cool. seen something really funny. Look at the video. Mm. It looks like my shirt says Ron Maiden. Oh, <laughs> there's the eye. <laughs> okay. No, sorry. It. If you're listening, Who's sorry. Who's Ron yeah. Maiden? Yeah, sorry. If Mine says Mr. Machine. There we go, yeah. Scooby. If you're listening to this, go and find the video because it looks like I'm wearing a Ron Maiden t-shirt. Ron Maiden is a new band. But, um, anyway, yeah, right. that was a lovely one because, like that. we said, yeah, the, the, the power and the journey just by dynamics and vocals is so obvious. It's really Again, good. it's all about the song writing more yeah. than the production, more than anything else. Yeah, beautiful agreed, song, agreed. beautiful song. Um, so we come to the penultimate track of the album, which is called One World. Um, the interesting thing for me as a bass player, and you can hear it straight off, is that there is slap bass, which it was very common for the time. You know, you had um, disco and funk were taking shape in the late 70s, but it kind of it, it hit its stride in the 80s. And even um, even non-disco and non-funk acts, you know, what, what Motown and Soul turned out to... What Motown and Soul... Um, transformed into in the 80s. There was often quite a bit of slap bass um, going around. And like I said, also funk, disco, um, that was all, um, yeah, it wasn't uncommon to hear some slap bass. So, and no uh, one does it anymore. Yeah, yeah, it's completely outdated. <laughs> if you play now. a slap today, someone's going to yeah. sack you. Another, another reference track is uh, Paul Simon, Graceland. There's a slap bass solo in the middle of the song. Oh, and yeah. um, whenever I hear any slap bass, my mind always goes to Graceland. So uh, yeah, find just... the middle of that. And just mentioning that they had a guest uh, musician again for that one, Stone Eleven on the bass. Yes, yeah. Who That's recorded really good, with yeah. loads of you know, famous bands. It was really interesting. I found this one to be the most like Money for Nothing out of the rest of the album. Although yeah. it wasn't, it was short, and I know Money for Nothing's long, but it was pop rock. It's, and it's even more 80s, more electronic, yeah. the vocals are full of effects, and yeah. it sounds like, you know... Well, you did, when like you were listening to it, you, you said there's that middle section where... It's quite I, I know it's a keyboard, but they on the keyboard they've got a harpsichord sound, and a harpsichord... Were, we mentioned this a few, you know, in the, one of the episodes last year. A harpsichord is a piano where the string is plucked instead of tapped. And J.S. Bach used it in all of his compositions in the 1600s. And you've got that sound coming in and it was very progressive, wasn't it? And you mentioned that to me. Yeah, there's a bit of a prog rock element for, you know, for bars. Which is, which is, another, really which is another style and genre we've heard in this album. Yeah. It's, another it's, one. There's so much Country, in it. pop, rock, Well, blues, just mentioning jazz. It, we talk about your latest trick, uh, the drums sound like bossa nova. So you got, you got that, that you got bossa nova, you got yeah. jazz, you got uh, pop, funk, rock, blues, blues. and now prog. It's there, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, do you have anything more to say about One World? No, let's no. move on to the last song, which Fantastic. for me uh, sums up the the album somehow. And it, it's like, it's a culmination of everything that, that happens. As you, as you said, it's not a concept album, but it takes you into a journey yeah, from the does, first to yeah. the last song. And when you get to the last song, I think the uh, traditional Dire Straits fans, they would feel a lot more comfortable listening to that song. That's a m much more typical Dire Straits song. Mm. And the guitar 
tells the story more than anything else. And it's a beautiful uh, guitar intro, guitar solo. It's very emotional. It, if you check any of the live versions, it's, it's, it feels like almost if Mark Knopfler is about to cry every time yeah, he sings I, it. I've read it's in my notes, emotional, it's it, lovely. It's very so beautiful. heartfelt song. It actually reminds me, do you know Albatross by Fleetwood Mac? I know oh, yeah. Albatross doesn't have any lyrics, yeah, yeah. does it? But um, yeah, yeah, I, I know the vibe. Yeah, yeah. The, the very chilled vibe, the guitar taking it really sweetly and gently. Lovely track. And again, I can I can pinpoint it as being an eighties track, but um, doesn't take anything away from well, it. It's a lovely track. He he wrote that song when the Falklands War uh, was going on. Oh, is but I that? believe it's about wars in general. Yeah. So it's about the feeling of soldiers in the battlefield thinking this is pointless. Well, what the hell are we doing here? Yeah, I just want to go back to my farm, back to my home, or whatever. And it's uh, it feels like you know it's like we all brothers. Why are we fighting? Yeah, so that the whole nice. thing. And he's, he mentions the fact that soldiers from both sides have the same ideology. Mm, so why are they yeah. fighting at all? And yeah. it's a beautiful song. Thinking about that makes you think about uh, how pointless it is to make wars. Yeah. And yeah, beautiful, fantastic, fantastic. great way to, to end an album. Yeah, it is. No, it's really nice. Um, yeah. So that take, brings us to the end of the album and. Funnily enough, to the end of the show, um, I want to just tell you what I think of the album, then I'm going to ask you a question. Yeah. So just to sum it up, and all of these albums we've done before, I have known or listened to before. This is the first one where I only heard it for the first time last night and was able to properly dissect it and listen to it myself. I think it's a really nice, accessible album. I think there is something for everybody. There are different genres incorporated, as we've just mentioned. Yeah. There's different styles. The fact that there's mus different musicians on each track sometimes. Yeah. Um, again, it just opens up another avenue. You may not like the drumming of this guy. Well, not the drumming, because it was one... I know what you mean um, about Omar. Yeah. He's on all of the album except the intro. But, for example, the bass playing. You might not like the bass playing on all the songs except One World. So it's just... They go against it musician. Everyone, exactly. Why not? So that's my thoughts on the album. I thought it was really good. Um... Very 80s, I think some of the sounds you could say are outdated now and probably don't hold up, but it wouldn't stop me from listening to it again. I really enjoyed it. I know. Um, so the question I want to ask you is, what for you did Brothers in Arms do for rock and roll and what impact has it had on rock music and music in general? Wow. Hard to define. I think uh, one of the most important things was... Uh, the quality of the songs matters more than anything else. At that time, mid eighties, you know, every single celebrity on the music industry would be good looking, young and appealing to young audiences. And they were just like a bunch of guys playing guitars, you know. Not saying you're not good looking, McAnoffler, <laughs> just saying that it's lot it's it's like uh, it was all about the music. It was all about how good the songwriting is. And it was about uh, that freedom of writing whatever you want to write. And, yeah. and just it, and just maybe... Uh, um, sorry, so different genres. Different genres. Um, the conversation, different yeah. styles. If he wanted a different musician on a track, he would get it. Yeah. That's a really valuable Also, yeah. a band that has reached uh, like the... the well, a level of success that most bands don't don't have. You get to that point, and you've made so much money. You've toured the world. You've got you know four uh, um, very successful studio albums, and it was pretty much the end of their career. Yeah, and, and they came up, an album and like they that. came up with an album just like so good. Yeah. So I believe what it made for rock and roll was to connect a band that was on the road for a while to uh, new uh, new fans, to a different audience. Did they and get new fans after this? Probably. Yeah. I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure they did because it's like most people uh, know this album and uh, more than, than the, the entire ones. career. Yeah, right. And Understand. most people... Uh, and obviously, it's it's the, the best-selling album and it's, um, you know, one of the best-selling albums in the history of music and yeah. rock and roll. I think so, it's... I read it's the ninth best-selling album in the UK ever. Okay, so take go. If yeah. you want to connect it, if I, if I want to say, okay, if I want to say just one thing to actually sum it up is um, Brothers in Arms made rock and roll accessible and commercial and it connected to the MTV era 
in a perfect way. I just Excellent. want to add to that at a time where rock and roll wasn't thriving in the mid eighties. No, not at all. Yeah, so even when you when point, you listen yeah. to this album and it's a bit cheesy sometimes, a bit two eighties, but it was way more rock and roll than most things at yeah, that time. That's a very good point. Yeah, yeah. it's really cool. Perfect. Well, that brings us nicely to the end of the episode. We, we hope you've enjoyed it. The, the whole album is going to be in the playlist as well as everything we've, um, that we've compared it to and stuff we've uh, put in. Um, so, yeah, once again, guys, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Felipe's finishing off his last bit of Guinness. Perfect. The episode last yeah, bit of right Guinness. The um, thank you so much for tuning in and listening. Um, again, our first show of 2022. Um, really excited to see what this year has in store for us, and we hope that you'll come on this journey with us. Um, please find us on our socials on Instagram and Twitter. We are at Long Live RNR Pod, and on in and on Facebook and YouTube, you search the Long Live Rock and Roll Podcast. Now, starting from January 1st, which was two days ago, we've set up a companion account called Today in Rock and Roll. And what we're going to be doing is for one year, we're going to be posting all the key events, moments and occasions of rock and roll in this account with nice photos that we've made and the research we've done. And we're going to post something every day. So every day you're going to learn what happened on this day in rock and roll as many years ago. So give that a follow if you're interested in the events and the facts and everything. Um, Apple subscribers, Apple podcast users, it would really help us with the algorithms and the visibility if you could give us a review on the Apple Podcasts app. Any review would do us so much favours in showing us uh, showing us up more on the app. Um, but again, once again, thank you for joining us, and we've had a great time. And yeah, any last things to say for Well, I just want to thank everyone who's been with us for the last year, and uh, I'm really looking forward to what we can achieve in this year 2022 wow fantastic yeah we've made it so thanks a lot for being with us and keep on rocking everywhere and as usual long live rock and roll <laughs>